Part two of our lecture on South and Southeast Asia begins. If you remember last time in part A, we talked about the um, basic beliefs and practices of Hinduism and Buddhism, and we finished off with the introduction of Islam into South Asia. So today we're going to talk about some of the Islamic states um, in uh, South Asia and also some Hindu states in South Asia. So here we go. Last time we had talked about how in 711 the first Muslim conquerors had come into India through the Hindu Kush Pass and pillaged and plundered and set up a kingdom, gained wealth, um, attacked Buddhist um, places of worship and monasteries and established themselves as a, as a political power in South Asia. So now let's go to 1200. So in 1206, we have a new Muslim state being created called the Sultanate of Delhi. So these Muslims, as we have talked about before, are Turks. They had come in from Central Asia, and while Turks in other areas were spreading into Southwest Asia, Turks from Central Asia that are Muslim are coming in to South Asia and establishing empires. So we call these Mamluks, um, like we had talked about before, these Turkish warriors who were coming in. They are going to set up an administrative system that is not normal for India. Um, we had said in our last lecture that India has had empires, but for the most part, even when they have an empire, they are decentralized. You have, in theory, uh, an emperor, but for the most part, the local power stays with the local rajas, or that means local king or prince. This, the Sultanate of Delhi is trying to change all that. Based on models that they've seen in the rest of the Islamic world with an all-powerful central ruler, and remember we in the past we've talked about a khalif or a sultan, and so we're going to see that they're going to try to bring that uh, idea of a centralized state with a sultan into India. So they're going to try to centralize control. So they come into India and they conquer northern India. And it's important to know that they never, Muslims never are able to conquer the southern part of India. And you can see that even today. In South Asia today, um, Pakistan is going to be where you have lots of Muslims. And over here in Bangladesh, you're going to see lots of Muslims. But down here in southern India is mostly Hindu still. Um, and so we see how history is impacting current day India. Um, so the Sultanate of Delhi, this Muslim state, comes in, and of course, like everybody, they divide their empire up into provinces. But what they do is they remove Hindus as much as they can from um, local governance, and they're going to put Muslim officials whom they feel they can trust, right? Uh, the Sultanate of Delhi is a Muslim kingdom, and they don't feel they can trust Hindu kings and Hindu princes to govern their provinces loyally um, because they don't share a religion. And so we're going to put Muslims that we can hopefully trust because they're the same religion as us into control of these provinces in their attempt to centralize. Next, they're going to import the idea of Sharia law. So if you remember, we have talked about in Southwest Asia, Sharia law, the law of using the Quran as a basis of your legal system, is going to travel with conquest into northern India. Hindus are allowed to continue their faith, just like in the rest of the Muslim world where you have Dumini, the, the official word for people of the book, or Jews and Christians who are allowed to practice their faith as long as they paid the jizya. We're going to see the same thing happen here in India, because if you're a Muslim conqueror, there are just way too many Hindu people in India to try to suppress and convert. Um, you have a full-out rebellion on your hands, and that's what, not what they want to do. That would destabilize the Sultanate of Delhi. So what they do is they say, okay, if you're a Hindu, you're a protected class, you're part of the Dimini, um, and we're going to let you continue to practice your faith as long as you pay the Jizya tax. However, what we're going to see is they don't want Hinduism to grow. And so just like the Ottomans and the Seljuks did in Southwest Asia, they're going to say you can't build new um, Hindu temples, you can't go out and try to convert people to Hinduism, you can't build new shrines, and if we, you do, we're going to destroy them. So there is tolerance of Hinduism, but um, not uh, so much as that we're going to allow them to continue to convert and to spread and to grow at the expense of Islam. So number two, let's talk about the slow conversion of people in India to Islam. So when we do see pe more people being Muslim because we see Muslims coming in and conquering and being positions of power. But there are other ways that people convert. And these are people that are Hindus or former Buddhists that are converting. So one of the ways we've talked about before is when Muslim merchants come in to establish 
trade networks. Um, a Muslim may come into India, and let's say that here is a large town in India, right? Um, and so Muslims will come in and they'll set up a Muslim quarter, sometimes called a diasporic community, which is important to know. And that is going to be all Muslims living together in a small section of the city. And of course, this is human nature. You're going to want to live someplace where your neighbors speak Arabic like you do, celebrate the same holidays, go to the mosque like you do. It's just a feeling of comfort and familiarity. And so we're going to see these small Muslim diaspora communities pop up in Indian cities, trade cities. Um, now the rest of the city may be Hindu, right? Um, we have seen that a lot of Buddhists have been wiped out because of previous invasions and the attacking Buddhist wats and temples. Um, but we see, so we are seeing people come in, not just as conquerors and uh, Muslims come in and live, but also as merchants. Next, so that's for the Muslims coming in. But what about some of these Hindus? Well, if I'm a Hindu in the merchant class, and I have to trade a lot with these Muslims here in the diaspora community, I know that if there are, let's say we have two Hindu merchants, and this Muslim is trying to decide which one to trade with, this Hindu merchant or this Hindu merchant, um, and if I trade with them, I get more money. And so what happens is this Hindu may stop being Hindu and he may convert to Islam, become a Muslim, because that way there's more likelihood that these two guys will trade with each other if they're the same faith. And so we see here's another way of Islam spreading is that people will convert to increase trade. Um, trade and merchants will spread religions. Next, on, on a third way we see people convert to Islam. Uh, let's say that I'm this Hindu here and I have a daughter and she falls in love with this Muslim merchant's son. And so in order to marry him, she has to convert to Islam. And so some people will convert through marriage. Next way that people convert to Islam. Well, these people who were Buddhist before, they don't have a uh, monastery to go pray at or support. And so they're looking for something to replace it. And here is this new vibrant religion that comes in, Islam. Um, and, you know, they have lots of spirituality. They, they have a close connection to their God, Allah. And you have had all of your access to the Buddha wiped out. You don't have a, a temple anymore. And so it's natural that you might say, well, let me see about this new faith. Let me see what they have to offer because my faith is kind of on the ropes here. And so some Buddhists, former Buddhists may have converted to um, Islam. Next group of people that might convert. If you remember, in India we have the caste system where we have this kind of triangular um, structure of society. And the two lowest castes, um, the mer who are merchants and artisans, and then we have the shudra, who are just common everyday workers, they are treated the worst in society. They have the least social status. Um, and in Hinduism, right, the only way to move up in society is to die, and through samsara, you can be reincarnated as a higher level. But if I'm in these lower castes, I don't, maybe I don't want to wait until the next life. Maybe I want salvation now. Maybe I want to have equality now. And so in the past, they might have converted to Buddhism because that promised instant salvation to nirvana. But that's been wiped out for, the, for a lot of places. And so here's this new faith that says we are all equal in the eyes of all law. So it doesn't matter if you're in the lowest class or the second lowest class. You can have equality in our religion's eyes today. Um, and that, as you can imagine, is very appealing to people in the lower castes. Well, oh, sorry, my phone just went off. I will mute that. Sorry about that. All right, next. Um, so next we have Sufis. So we had talked about how Sufis are people who are a different sect of Islam who will try to spread Islam um, to other regions. They're, they believe in mysticism and you know, they believe in a close, personal, emotional relationship with Allah. Um, and so we, they believe in music and dancing and anything that's going to heighten your emotion and give you this feeling of euphoria and a sense that you're getting close to Allah. And so these Sufis kind of act as missionaries for Islam. And so they're going to come in in India um, and they're going to start to practice their faith. And, you know, here's some Sufis down here dancing um, with music. And as you know, if you've ever danced with music, you feel emotional and you, you feel happy. Um, and so that you can think, well, maybe this is Allah touching me in my spiritual life. And so this is very appealing to people um, in Hinduism, this, this tense connection to a God that loves you and cares about you. So we see Sufis convert people for that reason. 
Um, we've already talked about the dance and the music. Um, next, a lot of these Sufis are ascetic, right? They have given up worldly possessions. They have given up the search for wealth and all, this, all those kinds of things. And this is a very holy lifestyle. And so for these people who are maybe searching for faith in India, they see these very religious men and they're like, wow, I think I am going to listen to what they have to say. Because these Sufis, they've given up everything for their God. Um, maybe they really respect what they have to say. Who can live like that? That's amazing. And so it gives them a little legitimacy when they come and they talk about about Islam and Allah. Next, the Sufis with their mysticism and, and, and you know, um, spirituality and their, this close personal connection and emotion to Allah, people in India start to believe that they have healing powers. Um, and the Sufis are like, well, yeah, we have healing powers. And so, you know, if you're a Hindu who is kind of struggling with their faith or a former Buddhist, and you see all of this amazing stuff in Sufism, and, you know, maybe a Sufi mystic comes and prays over your, your wife who is sick and she miraculously gets better. Like, wow, this must be a really strong God and so I'm going to convert for that reason. Another reason that people convert to Sufis, because Sufis are not, they're not as strict as far as doctrine goes at this time. They don't say that you have to follow an orthodox, strict following of Islam. They're a little bit more lenient. And so if a Sufi mystic comes in and you're like, well, I might like to be Muslim, but, you know, I really like this god Shiva or this god Vishnu or I like these traditions that I do or these holidays. The Sufi are like, it's all good. You know, maybe, um, you know, what, what you're doing can still be practiced and just add Islam. And so that kind of flexibility um, allows people to kind of blend these two faiths, um, as we will see, and, you know, start the conversion process. Now, as, so those are all reasons that we see um, Islam growing in India, those two slides. So as Islam grows, we're going to see that Hindu leaders are starting to get a little nervous, right? They see, they see Islam growing and more and more and more converts among the people. And so Hinduism overtly and maybe subconsciously has to respond. Um, otherwise, their religion may not survive. And so we see that we see what we have called, um, you know, spiritual Hinduism start to grow, right? Um, popular Hinduism. It's this idea that, you know, what do we like about Islam? What do people like about Islam? And so we see Hindu leaders see that people really like this spiritual connection to an all-powerful God. And certainly that was part of Hinduism before. Remember, that was one of the many dharmas you could go. But now we put more emphasis on this. And it's called devotional Hinduism, right? Where you devote your life to a god and you start to develop that close personal relationship. And so while it was already around in Hinduism, this idea of devoting yourself to a god as a dharma, now it's going to be even more of a focus, more heightened. And so we get this kind of devotional Hinduism start to really take off. It's very spiritual and you have this connection to one of your gods. And we see either Vishnu or Shiva or Ganesh or whoever, right? Now we see, then we see even more changes in Hinduism. Not all Hindus at all, but we see a growing minority movement called the Bhakti movement. The Bhakti movement is what we call a syncretic faith, where they really don't just take aspects of the new faith of Islam, but they take a big chunk of Islam and they blend it with their traditional Hinduism. And it becomes a brand new faith, a syncretic faith, that doesn't just have aspects, but has whole sections of the new faith incorporated and weaved into their Hinduism. And so this bhakti movement is going to take what they like from Islam and add it. And so, you know, in this class, we talk about cultural diffusion. We talk about when groups of people meet through war or conquest or trade or missionaries. It's kind of like a buffet, right? You have your, you have your plate, you have your culture. But as you look at the new culture that's being introduced, you're like, oh, I like that. I'm going to put that on my plate, just like you do at a buffet, right? Oh, I like that. I'm going to put the potatoes on my plate, but I'm not going to put the asparagus on my plate, right? You take what you like about the new culture and add it to your own old culture. And so what you get is this bad analogy, but this new kind of syncretic plate, this new faith, right? Um, and so we see that the Hindus really like this devotional aspect of Islam, especially these bhaktis. And so they, they have, they're like, okay, we're really going to be focused on Shiva or Vishnu or who knows, maybe Allah. Um, and so we, you know, we get this devotional aspect to the bhakti movement. But they think, okay, so when do we feel the most connected to our God, whether it's Allah or Shiva or Vishnu or whatever, when do we feel the most connected? And they think, well, that's when we 
you're emotional and you're emotional when you're dancing or when you're listening to music or maybe when you're taking hallucinogenic drugs, right? Because it alters your state. And, you know, they didn't know the brain chemistry at that time, why drugs affect brain chemistry. They just knew they're in this altered state that maybe, you, you know, when they see these visions and they think, well, maybe this is my God talking to me. Um, and so we see that, you know, the Bhakti movement is going to incorporate these things into their worship. Next, uh, these Hindus will take the idea from Islam that you can have immediate salvation, that you don't have to go through samsara, right? You don't have to go through reincarnation and eventually, after many lives, reach uh, a Brahmin priest, and then after that, maybe reach moksha. Um, and so what they think is, no, I want to I be with God now. I, you know, when I die, I want to go straight to heaven, and I want to reach enlightenment. And so they take this idea of immediate salvation, which of course is very popular among the lower caste, not having to go through all of those, um, those steps, right? You can reach salvation now. And then we see just even blending of gods, right? We see that Hindus who worship Vishnu may be like, you know what? Maybe Vishnu and Allah are really just the same God, right? Maybe they just have different names. And so that's a great example of the syncretic blending of faiths. So we will talk about more examples from syncretic faiths as we go throughout the year. It is certainly an important aspect of this course, but this is a great example of cultural diffusion, cultures blending together to form something new, a syncretic faith. Right. Next, we see India, India impacts the Islamic world. So cultural diffusion never just goes in one direction. When a new culture comes in, the old culture is going to take some of the stuff from the new, like I said, like a buffet. But also, the conquerors are going to be affected by the conquerees. It just happens right when cultures come together. And so in India, a lot of Indians had already had been fascinated and delving into the world of science and math for a long time. And we had already talked about how Muslims are receptive to new new learning, um, and new ideas. And so as Muslim merchants and Muslim conquerors come in, they start to learn about some of these new ideas in science and math from India. So for example, Indians had been good enough at astronomy to predict eclipses. Um, and they showed that math to Muslims, and Muslims like, this is awesome, and they take that back, maybe to the House of Wisdom um, back in Baghdad or to other places. Um, and they're like, oh, wow, this is good. So the, the, so the Islamic world is learning about how to predict eclipses. Next, Hindus came up, um, and people in India had come up with a theory of gravity way before it ha was uh, thought up in Europe with Sir Isaac Newton, um, years in the future. And so Muslims are going to be like, wow, this is really good. We really like this science. This is amazing. And they take that idea back to the Islamic world. Next, because um, people in India had been so good with math and observing the motion of the planets and the stars, they had actually discovered um, seven planets already in our solar system. And so that knowledge is dispersed back through into Southwest Asia um, and North Africa and in Spain, all of the Islamic world. But let's go to medicine. So people in India had a long had an interest in medicine and healing. And so we had seen that people in India knew what was inside of the body and how to set broken bones. So that medical knowledge is going to be dispersed to the, to the Islamic world. And even going so far as the idea of inoculations. Now, they weren't quite sure what viruses were and bacteria at that point, but they did discover that if you get a less virulent version of a virus um, and you in purposely inject somebody with it, then their body will develop antibodies and be able to withstand attacks by the more dangerous version of the virus. And so, of course, the great example of this is smallpox. Smallpox is a pathogen that it attacks people, it gets all these blisters on your body, and you die, and it has a high mortality rate. But um, what we see here is that the Hindus in India had discovered that if you have, um, there's this another pox that affects cows, it's called the cow pox, or um, other animals, and you think, hmm, well, let me take that virus that is not deadly to humans, inject that into the body, and the body develops antibodies that can fight it. And so when smallpox does attack, it's related to this cowpox, um, your body already knows how to fight it. And so like I said, this is years ahead of when Europe will discover this. But this knowledge is invented in India and makes it back into the Islamic world, Dar al-Islam. Next, we're going to talk about algebra. Now, we've already said this in our previous notes, but algebra is invented in India. Muslims will learn about it. We had said Muslims called it algebra. Um, and then eventually Europeans will learn about it and call it algebra. Um, the Greeks had invented geometry, but India had invented it as well. Um, and so we see that both from the Mediterranean and from India, Muslims are learning about geometry. 
Next, so Indians are going to invent a number system. Um, and we can see here, we can see how it's changed over time um, from early at the top to much later and more recent at the bottom. And so our modern numbering system that we have here in the West actually was invented in India. And it's very good for math, and we'll talk about why that is in a second. Um, it makes it easier to do math, this number system. And so Muslims are like, this is great. We should adopt these characters for our mathematics. Event, and so that's where the Islamic world came, found out about it. Now, eventually, most knowledge in world history goes from east to west. Um, and so we're going to see that from India to the Arab world, these num numbers are going to be created. And then uh, people in Europe interact with Muslims, and they learn about these, and when they, they mistakenly call them Arabic numerals, because they think that these numbers came from the Arab world, when in fact Muslims themselves got them from India. And so we see this is a great example of cultural diffusion and ideas spreading. Now the reason this numbering system is so good is because you have a zero in it. I know you can't see it here, um, but the zero is a placeholder. And of course, in math, it, it, unless you want to have to just put down a new character for every single number there is, which is going to be an infinite number of characters, it's much easier just to learn 10 characters. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 9, and 0. And 0 becomes that placeholder, so when you get to 10, you don't have to invent a new character to learn for 10. You just put 1 with the placeholder of 0 for the 1's place, and then you can start counting in the tens place. And this makes it much more easy to do math if you even have to learn a new character for 10 and 11 and 12 and keep going. And so we see that Indian uh, mathematicians were way advanced at this time, delving into new ways to do math and algebra and geometry. But it even goes further. They enveloped fractions of numbers, right? Decimals. They even came up with negative numbers and they calculated the value of pi along with the Greeks. And so we see, again, all of this knowledge is spreading across the Islamic world from India um, west. This is a cultural example of cultural diffusion instead of just not just numbers and math and science. The game of chess was invented in India. Um, here we can see what actual live people as chess pieces. But then Muslims will find out about this game and love it. And then eventually it'll make its way to Europe. And when chess gets its way to Europe, we see kind of the traditional classic that we know today pieces um, because it made it to Europe in the medieval period. So that's why the Europeans invented symbols for the different pieces like a castle and a knight and a bishop and a king and a queen. You get the idea. Um, and so, um, so that's kind of Europe's twist on the game. But the game itself is invented in India and then moves west and through the Islamic world. Next, Islam's impact on India. So now we're going the other way. So the last few slides were how India is impacting Islam. So now we're going to talk about, besides religion, how the Islamic world is impacting India economically. So um, let's talk about paper. So paper was invented in China and then made its way west along the Silk Roads to the Islamic world. And then from the Islamic world, it kind of takes a U-turn and goes back into India. And so if you are a person who's wanting to study the Quran because you're a new convert, you're going to need a Quran made of paper so it's cheap and you can afford it and get it. Or maybe you want to study the Upanishads if you're Hindu or the Rig Veda if you're Hindu. All of these religious books, and then they're much cheaper if they're made of paper. Plus, if you're a merchant, you can now keep track of your records, which you of course need to do. Um, if you're a mathematician, all of these people need a cheap way of recording their ideas and their interactions. And so paper is introduced to India. Um, the Islamic world also invents the water wheel. Of course, it's what you need to do if you're going to turn wheat into flour, or if you're going to power some simple machine. And so the water wheel comes in. And as we see here in the picture, the spinning wheel, which helps you you turn cotton into, into yarn, which you can then weave into a shirt. Um, all of those things are going to come from the Islamic world into India. Next, increased trade. So here's, here's South Asia, and here's the Sultanate of Delhi. Right, And so is the, they're Muslims, and the rest of the, of course, Islamic world is Muslims. And so whether we have the Seljuks or whether we have their Ottomans by now, right, Muslims will trade more readily with Muslims. And so we lots, see lots of trade going on between India, Islamic India, and Islamic Southwest Asia. And so we see lots of overland trade going on just because um, they're the same religion. But also, and here's an important fact, right, that we need to know, that when empires get really big, let's say that this empire gets really 
really big and stretches all the way to here. And let's say the sultanative delta gets really big and stretches all the way to here. Now, any, anything with inside this empire is going to be easy to trade because it's protected by the government. They have troops and forts. Same with this government. And so trade is really easy. So the danger zone, right, where it's, it's unsafe to trade because there aren't any government outposts and, and troops to protect people from raiders um, and pirates and whatever, that, that, that danger zone that's unprotected shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And so now as these empires get bigger and bigger and they almost touch or sometimes do touch, we see that trade rapidly increases because it's just physically safe to travel from place to place when you have these large empires protecting you. And so we see that as a reason for increased trade, overland trade. Now another reason we see an increased trade is maritime trade. So in the Indian Ocean, um, probably around 600 or so, um, 600 AD or um, Common Era CE, we had seen that people in the um, people who were mariners and merchants in the Indian Ocean had discovered how to use the monsoon winds. So in India, in the Indian Ocean, for six months of the year, the wind blows consistently from south to north, both directions of India. Um, and then the winds switch and they blow consistently without changing kind of from north to south. Now, if you know this, right, and you have a sailing ship, you can absolutely take advantage of this. So let's say you're a merchant over here in East Africa and you're like, how can I quickly, easily get to India to trade goods? Well, you just wait for the winds to change for six months and they're going to shoot you right across the Indian Ocean to India. It's hardly any work at all and it's really fast because the ocean currents are going to be pushed by the wind to some extent. And we also, so the winds just push your ship, uh, push your ship and it's just like an express trip. Then you trade and you rest up for six months or however long. And when the winds change, you can go straight back home really fast. Um, and so we see that India is going to become the center of maritime trade at this time because they're in the center of these monsoon winds. And Muslim and Hindu uh, merchants are going to discover this. And they're going to take advantage of these monsoon winds. Next, Right, that we've talked about the lateen sail. So the lateen sail is invented in India, and that is a sail that's adjustable. So you can always sail, doesn't matter what direction the wind is blowing. And so that's going to make its way from India into the Islamic world over here in the Mediterranean. From the Islamic world, eventually, um, after about 1400, um, we're going to see that make its way to Westerners uh, in the in Europe. All right. Next, uh, the compass. We've already talked about that. The compass is invented here in China. And through the Silk Roads or through maritime trade, um, we're going to see that invention is going to make its way into the Indian Ocean and into the Islamic world, making it safer to travel. Next, the astrolabe. So the astrolabe is invented by the ancient Greeks, and Muslims are going to find out about it, and then they're going to bring the astrolabe. I know it's getting messy, but I think you're make, I'm making the point, right? We're going to see the astrolabe make its way to India, and Indian merchants and sailors are going to figure out how to use this thing to measure your location um, north-south on the earth. Um, and so that's going to make maritime trade more successful. And then from China, we're going to see these things called junks. So here's a junk. This is from China. It's a very large ship, and we'll talk more about them when we get to China, but there are these very large ships that are very hard to sink. And of course, if you're a merchant taking trips back and forth, you're going to want to have the biggest ship possible because a big ship means you can carry a lot of cargo, and a lot of cargo means a lot of sails, um, and you can make a lot of money. Um, and so we see that these large junks make their way into India, bringing even more trade. Um, now, dows are going to be what we call the ships in India with the lateen sails. And so um, we're going to see them plying the waters, dows that are probably Hindu or Muslim merchants, and then junks that might be Chinese sailors that come into the Indian Ocean. So all of this makes for a very vibrant, successful, rich area of trade, India. So what you see here are, uh, I know it's hard to see them, but you see a bunch of little dotted blue areas. These are trade routes. Um, and, but the main thing here is I wanted to show you is that very rarely do you have one merchant go all the way from China around the, you know, the, here the Straits of Malacca um, into the Indian Ocean and then back. It would just take too long. And that means that it would take too long to make profit. What you want to do as a merchant is take short trips. And so you want to go from maybe this port to this port, Manila, and you just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth because it's a short trip. And every time you make a turn and go back the other direction, you make a profit. So that's much better than going the whole way. Um, and so we see that trade is done in stages. And so Chinese merchants may come in contact with Southeast Asia. 
Asian merchants, who come in contact with Indian merchants, who come in contact with Arab merchants. And so as we go, we see the price of goods go up and up and up, so there's more profits to go with every stage of the way. Now, maritime trade is usually going to be bulky items, things that are heavy, that are hard to transport. Um, so it might be textiles, like cotton. Um, it might be spices, those kinds of things. When we see um, less bulky items, really low weight but high value items, like um, some spices, but also gems and silk, um, we're going to see those go on the silk roads. Obviously, if you're going to travel over land, you don't want to carry really bulk, big, bulky items. It's just going to make it hard to do. But on a boat, that's no big deal. You just put it in the hold of your boat. You don't have to carry it. The wind does the work. And so we see, you know, high, we see high weight bulky items in the mar maritime trade, and we see low weight but high value items on the silk roads. We, so this is just reconnecting with our first part one of our notes, is that all of this trade increases, we're going to see the jati become more numerous, right? Because we, we see merchants in a specific caste, but with all of this trade, we're going to see merchants start to specialize in one thing, right? They're going to specialize in diamonds, or they might specialize in rubies, or they might specialize in cotton, or they might specialize in silk. And so we see there is a need to really kind of subdivide that caste system into these jati. And we had talked about how these jati are then going to control trade. They're going to control production amount and quality and prices and all of those things. So the jati become even more important as this trade increases. All right. Next, let's go. So that's it for the Islamic world in India. Let's now talk about the part of India that does not become Islamic. And that is southern India. Muslims never conquer the southern part of India. And so what we have here, there's many Hindu kingdoms at this time, but we're just going to focus on one. And so we have Vijayanagara Empire. And I'm sure I didn't quite pronounce that right, but close. Um, and so what we have here, this is an empire that is down here. And it's going to unite a whole bunch of Hindu kingdoms into one empire. So one of the things that we need to focus on is they're going to block Islamic expansion into all of India. And so as the Sultanate of Delhi tries to conquer more and more of India, we're going to see that this empire stops them and they have several battles. And so they're rivals that stop them from controlling all of India. And so we see a lot of India is going to stay Hindu because this is a Hindu kingdom. And since they're a Hindu kingdom, of course, they're going to re-emphasize Hindu beliefs. However... Um, what we're going to see, we are going to, add, certainly in kind of in this area where these two cultures are blending the most, and of course up here, right, um, where Hinduism is first interacting with Islam, we're going to see that that's where we see a lot of the syncretic religions, like the Bhakti movement. Um, and this Hindu empire was okay with that as long as it doesn't spread too much, right, because we still sort of consider them Hindu, because they have still lots of aspects of Hindu in them. Um, but we see in any area where we see Islam interacting with Hinduism, we're going to see these syncretic faiths. Not so much down here in extreme southern India, because we just don't see Muslims get down here, and so we're not going to see as many syncretic faiths there. Now, um, this, this empire, of course, they're under pressure from the Islamic conquerors coming down, and so they need allies. They need somebody to help them to stop the Islamic advance. And so we will talk about, at the very end of this time period, the beginning of the next time period, we're going to talk about how we are starting to see Europeans kind of foray into the Indian Ocean, for just in the very beginning. And so at the first group of Europeans to do that are the Portuguese. And so this empire is going to make alliances with the Portuguese. Portuguese. And of course, they're going to use gunpowder weapons to try to recapture some of parts of India. And so what they'll do is they're going to conquer, uh, they're going to help the Portuguese conquer Goa, which we see right here. And so that's going to be a city that is mostly Hindu, but there's going to be small groups of Portuguese living in the city in diaspora communities, trying to control the port and get more trade into the region. It'll benefit Portugal. Next, so um, we had said that this is going to be a Hindu empire, um, but they're never actually able to centralize as much as the Sultanate of Delhi did. Um, it's just not the traditional way in India to have a strong centralized empire, at least not at this point in history. And so if you don't have a strong centralized empire, we've talked about something else in society needs to kind of take over the role of government if the government isn't strong enough to do those things. And so what we have here is kind of a temple-oriented society. Um, these Hindu temples are going to be taking on some of the role that the government may provide in other societies. 
And so in other societies, maybe you have a local leader or some kind of ruler that organizes the people to do irrigation projects or to harvest the crops. But we don't have that in southern India because it's a very decentralized empire. And so what we're going to do is to, to kind of fulfill that leadership role, Hindu holy men and Hindu temples are going to organize the peasants to do irrigation projects. The more irrigation we have, um, the more uh, crops we have, the happier the people are, especially in southern India. Because if you remember, if we go back here and we talked about the monsoon winds and so for six months of the year India gets a lot of rain as all of this wet air comes up from the ocean and then dumps onto the land but six, the other six months of the year when the winds change, the wind is coming from the land under the ocean, and that's very dry air. Right? There's no big body of water for the, for the atmosphere to soak up. And so during that dry season, you know, you don't want people to starve. And so during the dry season, we're going to see these Hindu temples figure out that if we organize the people in the rainy season, they can create reservoirs or dams and big irrigation projects. So in the dry season, right, the wet season, we will catch that water. And during the wet during the wet season, in the dry season, we can release some of that water that we've stored up into these irrigation ditches. And now we can grow food all year round. More food, happier people, more taxes, the government's happy. And so they're going to be critical in this and also getting the people to harvest um, in some kind of a coordinated way. Next, they're going to open up schools. So if we had talked about in the Islamic world, the government is doing that, right? They're opening up madrasas. But here in southern India that's Hindu, that, the government doesn't think it's their responsibility and they're not centralized. And so we see that these Hindu temples will start to open up schools, especially as trade increases. Merchants need to be able to have their sons be able to read and write so they can keep track of and have business correspondence and keep track of uh, their receipts and their records of their sales. And so we see that merchants are going to send their sons to these Hindu temples. And of course, this is something the government may normally do, but in the absence of that, the Hindu temple does that. Next, we're going to see them serve as bankers. So it's just, it kind of makes sense that lots of people will, of course, part of a sacrifice is to give something of value to you, to your church or mosque or temple or wat or synagogue, right, to help it function. Um, and so we see people have traditionally been giving money to these Hindu temples. But now what the Hindu priests say is, look, why don't we, since you're giving us some of your money, why don't you give us a little bit more and we'll hold on to it for you? And they start to act as bankers. And we have talked about that previously, how banking is going to help redistribute money to get it in the hands of merchants that might need it to get a loan to go out and do some new business venture. And so Hindu temples are also kind of fulfilling not just the role of government, but also bankers. All right, so that's it for part two. When we get to part three, we're going to talk about Southeast Asia um, and how that's impacted by Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam.